But you, I mean, you do love touring, don't you? Mm. I like it for about the first month. Then, frankly, it really is hard to keep uh, generating an, a, 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 a more excitement for the next performance, you know, because there's only so many ways that you can interpret a song. Mm. And after about the first month, you're done. So you then start finding that you're repeating, um, repeating yourself, and it's becoming almost a choreography, uh, an, in, uh, an internal choreography. You're thinking the same way about each song, and, and that's really tricky. You know, that's really tricky. I think that what the, the saving grace of any tour is to have uh, uh, fabulously invented musicians who take you off and go somewhere else. You know, yeah. and again, I don't keep on harping on this lot, but they're my favourite topic at the moment. Tim Machine. That's exactly what that's about. The, the guys within that band um, are used to the idea of not sticking to uh, a set way of doing things. Yeah. So their, their playing becomes very uh, ambitious sometimes. And, 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 and you can throw me quite yeah. radically, which is great. I, mean, I was listening to, to the Tim Machine a lot over the last couple of days because, I mean, obviously your, your commitment to it is, is, is total. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I wonder, perhaps, is, is it not that, the, 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 particularly the British, as, as your audience is, tends to be a little older now, yeah. and the, the, they kind of, you're, they're used to you progressing, and suddenly they think heavy metal, in a sense, is almost retrogressive step for you. Uh, it, yeah. Uh, or is it, that being indeed, bit? that's its definition. I'm not so yeah. sure. It does follow uh, by virtue of the fact that Reeves is in the band. Reeves has uh, spent most of his time in the ilk of band that's coming out of uh, Boston, which is very much, um, it, it's, I guess, uh, it, it started off as what was known as educated punk. It was, there was a series of bands, notably the Pixies. Who you are obviously very Oh, involved. a huge band. I think they're one, I'm pushing them like crazy. I think they're I the detected next. <laughs> for me, they're the next talking heads in as much as that they, uh, for me, the sci-fi, uh, uh, white middle class rock in America they have very pithy witty lyrics mm -hmm. and uh, an unconscious uh, uh, a reappraisal of what's gone before music I, mean, I think they're a, um, a, a great little outfit they're, they're, they're a lot of fun a lot of fun um, also uh, another band came out there called Dinosaur Junior mm -hmm. which is very much in the same area and those were the kinds of bands that Reeves in fact he was working with he had his own bands there and they were always to knock around with each other and it was like the the set, that was the Boston sound, you know. And it owed a lot to, in fact, punk, but the abilities of the guitarist were yeah. probably a bit better. Uh, it doesn't really have its roots in, in metal, per se. Yeah. But I mean, no, I, I remember, I remember And for me, heavy metal would have to be a, um, a Death Leopard or a Metallica yeah. or that kind of thing, which yeah. I don't feel that we would want to align ourselves in that area. I think we'd feel more comfortable in the area of uh, Black Ranker and Yes, but I mean, you've always, there's always been the, the, the sort of, you know, if you like, the loud guitar sound. Loud guitar. Without, <laughs> without doubt. Without doubt. Okay, yeah. Let's not sit <laughs> ahead. It's very bloody loud guitar. Yeah. yeah. But then, very aggressive. Given, given your obvious delight at working with these people, yeah. I mean, why are you doing a sort of, an almost, it's like a sort of great, the greatest hits tour? It is a greatest hits tour, without doubt. There's no other I mean, words. Cynics could say, you know, Greatest it's, songs, I suspect, because I think. Uh, the kind, a lot of the songs, I've not had that many greatest hits, I've only had a couple of like, number one things in America. Uh, a third one with, uh, was with uh, Mick Jagger, so yes. it's, it's hardly uh, fair to claim it as one of mine. Um, and in England, uh, likewise, I think I'm actually better known for albums than I am for, for the, the relevant singles that came from them, although they indeed are known. But things like Changes, for instance, yeah. it's, it's quite as well known as any single that I've ever done. So it, I think it's more of it's, it would be more of favourite songs kind of thing. But why? I mean, yeah, I mean, okay. Yeah, why? I mean, it, you know, people are going to say, look, it's the Stones are on tour. It's, it's is it? There must be money, a lot of money involved in this. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I mean, one. This is your pension fund. Uh, we don't know because we don't know what we'll make on. You know, and it's always it's all, you. Whatever happens in music, you never know until you actually go for it what the reaction is going to be. I mean, one puts out albums not knowing if you're going to sell or not. Yeah. Um, I've had a series of inc uh, calamities, huge calamities with albums in terms of sales. Like? And, well, for starting with, uh, <laughs> uh, starting with Aladdin Sane, yeah. which like, didn't sell at all. But now, the, uh, the odd thing about those things is that they actually became, in retrospect, fairly well-known albums. 
Alan is saying diamond dogs didn't do very well at all. Uh, Low was, of course, which is my favourite album of any of the albums I know, was an absolute non-starter. Oh, I was working on it. Absolute yeah, non-starter. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and you know, generally the kind of attitude that I had to kind of put up with from uh, a lot of executives at that place at the time. I mean, that absolutely loathed what I was doing. Hmm. And that well, didn't they tell you to sort of go back and go back to Philadelphia? They actually sent me a letter saying, "Go back to Philadelphia, please, David. Please go back to uh, Philadelphia and uh, see if you can't do something in the area of young America." Which was so soul destroying for me as an artist at the time because I put so much into low. I thought this was a really interesting new approach to music, you know, and, and we were all excited about it. And to get that back was like, oh, shit. Why should, should we maybe be working with each other anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, to, go, to go on from there, uh, um, a low lodger, mm -hmm. very bad indeed. Um, Never let me down. Mm -hmm. Did better probably than anything pre Let's Dance, but in comparison to me. Yeah. Then it starts to become relatives. Yes. Because once you hit Let's Dance, you've got that's the most albums I ever sold in. Anyway. How many records have you sold out from West? Not that many. I mean, but seriously, not 30 that many. million? Uh, let me see. Oh, probably not anywhere like that. No. I don't sell records. Yeah. I and my music, like Dylan, are much better known than album sounds. So that means a that you're foreigner, not, yeah. a, a foreigner, a band like foreigner or something like that, would outstrip me heads and shoulders in Alex. So in other words, you're half as rich as everyone thinks you are. Oh, no, good God. No. Chance would be a fine thing. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but then, I mean, is this, I mean, the, I mean, you know, the cynics will say that this, this, is, this is designed to put your, presumably there's a sort of sense you want to put your... Well, that's okay for them to say yeah, that. They're, yeah. they're very entitled to do that. But the only thing that I have a bit of a problem is it seems odd for me to ask an entertainer why he's working. Uh, um, a question I was asked at a press conference particularly annoyed me when they said, you're doing all your songs, isn't that cashing in? And my immediate reaction to that was, whose song should I be doing then, for fuck's sake? Yeah. You know, do I go out and do Cure songs? I mean, whose <laughs> songs am I expected to do on a tour? Yeah. And is it very important to you that one, should I only pick obscure songs of mine, or should I pick songs that people really want to come and hear? Mm -hmm. I think it's a, I think it's a, a moot point, frankly. I think it's an easy setup. Yeah, that's a question. But I mean, you, you, you know, you say. So I was going to answer your question. Yeah. So Ryko Disc was passionate about putting about the, uh, putting out a best known one because obviously it helps their catalogue. And they asked me if I give it support, and I said, well. I will, and well, not only that, it would be, it could be very useful to me as an artist to be able to actually at the same time stop doing them. Because mm -hmm. if I do it one, this one time, something I've never done, which is do play all the songs that people want to hear, because yeah. I, I do have a penchant for playing obscure, and right. kind of, you know, treat my shows much more as a vehicle for an inventive way of doing songs or something yeah. like that, um, a display as much as anything else. Uh, it, it might be a, a good way of actually finishing one phase to allow me to give me motivation to carry on my work in other areas so that I can no longer depend on going out with old songs. So that when I'm uh, in my late 40s, I'm sorry, my um, that, that I, I will have built up, hopefully, a new repertoire, something reflective of this present period that we're going through. And for me, and it keeps me motivated. Yeah, but do you think, do you really think that, 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 that you know, in six years' time, you won't still have to play something? Absolutely. Something? Never again. I'm absolutely committed to it. Never say never? No, no, no I will say never. Yeah. I will definitely never do them again. Possibly. <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> serious. You have to say that. I'm, no, I don't. I don't. No, I, it's unequivocal. I, I definitely, absolutely made up my mind that this is something I very much want to do. I think because... For so many of us who are at this age in rock, it is unusual for us where it's never happened in rock. That there are, it's, it does now embrace an enormous age range. Yeah. Isn't for some modern music, because it's no longer fair to just, just call it rock anymore. I think that rock or rock and roll, that, it, that they're sort of uh, uh, frankly inadequate descriptions of exactly what music is now. Popular music. Right? I think so. I feel more comfortable with popular music. It's never reached this stage except because it. It has done in big bands and jams and that and so, but for us, it's new. Yeah. 
So we can follow the tradition of what's always gone down before, where you uh, you you uh, you drag your legacy along with you, yeah. Uh, or you can try doing what we used to be known for doing, which was trying new things. So one new thing that occurred to me is to not do anything I've done before, just do it, almost finish that phase, and then start up again because nobody is doing that, and I want to see what happens right. to an artist when he does that. Do you feel then that in the sense of the eighties you marked time a bit? Um, I think there was a fair degree. I picked up my own enthusiasms again. I must be frank, when I started working with Reeves the Brass and the idea and the occurrence of Tim Machine. I had the, the, the two albums there uh, that immediately followed uh, Let's Dance were from, I was in a, I felt like I was in some kind of mire. I wasn't quite sure what I was doing anymore. And it's unfortunate because I laid too much emphasis on working in, a, in an environment where it was producer oriented uh, where it had a session man feel to it and, mm -hmm. and that frankly I think I lost some very good songs in there somewhere because I, I, I liked a lot of the material that I was attempting to do yeah. but I just didn't think my approach was anywhere near as accurate as it should have been. But weren't you in a sense making up for having lost some of the 70s? Lost some of the 70s? Well, I mean, you've often, in the past you've talked about. I mean, the station. I mean, station station is just my favourite record of yours. But I mean, I've heard you in the past say that you really don't remember very much of a year or so. Uh, that's very true. I didn't. I mean, there's a, yeah, the short. There's a whole period between late seventy four and seventy six, which is very, very hazy. What was? What were you doing? Well, cocaine, obviously. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but an enormous lot. I mean, you had to do quite a lot. Ah, uh, excessive amounts of cocaine. I was, uh, you know, an absolute, complete uh, addict to it. Very, very, very addicted to it in a highly dangerous fashion. Um, but I don't quite understand the relevance of that, of losing my two years in uh, the, the, the lost weekend of the <laughs> 70s, uh, how I would be compensating by those doing those two hours in the 80s. You'll have to. Making some money. Oh, I see. Financial. I mean, because Let's Dance was a brilliant, huge success. Yeah. It's always a success. Yeah. The next two albums were. I mean, from my point of view, I've been a huge fan of yours since God knows when. Yeah. Um, and sort of, you lost me in the eighties because I just sort of felt I didn't like the, the glass. I didn't like the glass fight. That's before. unfortunate. I, 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 <laughs> I mean, tonight. I mean, I love Let's Dance. Yeah. But it it wasn't to me a great Bowie album. It was a great album, but it wasn't. It was, tonight, wasn't it? What it was, in fact, was a great Noel Rogers album. Yeah. I mean, tonight was I was very keen on because a friend of mine, Hugh Padgham was working with you on yeah. that and so I mean you know I was hoping for him I wanted it to be a success yeah. and I just and Tin Machine when it came out I mean having been listening to a lot of it, it's starting to make a little more sense yeah but so I, I kind of felt a bit let down I think some other the, the, the oh I quite certainly did and I think in some areas not I do disagree with you about the tour I I, I was feeling until I got to mid-America when in fact when we got to Europe and um, we did places like Spain and Italy and Germany. Yeah. When the reviews were so at, at, at complete odds to the initial reaction that we had to it in England, and uh, because of the Scandinavian shows. Now, one should never apologise or give excuses for one's work. But I must say that I felt the biggest mistake that was made on that tour was opening in daylight. I think the whole reasoning for doing the entire damn show was lost. Mm. To open in daylight and have the world's press there. I couldn't believe it. I said, Bill, this time hasn't got down. And he said, ah, be all right, a lot of people here. I said, Bill, <laughs> this time hasn't got down, and this whole fucking show is about lighting. Yeah. And, even, and, and even, that, even as a rock star, you can't make the sun go down. You can't make the sun go down. <laughs> Put a tent up! Oh, God, what are we going to do? So it was all that, because, I mean, in our, I mean, it was, it was one of the most ludicrous oversights ever. It's what time does the sun go down here? Yeah. So for me, I mean, that, that I felt that I'd been set up I should have done more homework myself. I thought we'd been set up very badly for the start of that tour. Subsequently, we got to play it indoors in quite a few places in the rest of Europe, and it received unbelievably good press. In, in, in terms of it being uh, innovative, that uh, the approach to presenting rock, uh, it was totally new, there hadn't been anything like that yeah. before, uh, and that there were areas of it which surely would change the way that rock was done. Absolutely, because I, I remember very much at the time that one of the first things that happened is that uh, the entire print show came up to see us initially, went back to America, 
came over with a show which was not dissimilar to my approach. Right, so, and subsequently, the Stone Show owes an awful lot to the lighting style that I created on Glass Mine. Um, it was an innovative show. Now, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. Because it, it, keep trying. But it, 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 one keeps trying. But there, is the, there must be. However, yeah, on the albums, I do agree to a certain extent. I think the material in there, I think there was some extra material in there. I think a lot of it went very wrong. I think things like uh, um, uh, Dancing with the Big Boys with uh, Jim with the, was a, a fabulous track. I thought that was really an interesting variant on disco, on, on, on uh, dance music. It, it had that uh, free associational kind of quality to it. It was, uh, it was a very exciting piece of music now. I think some of the songs, uh, uh, Loving the Alien, um, Blue Jean, I think they're, they're great songs. They really are. Loving the Alien doesn't come anywhere near the demo that I did for him. That was really pisses you off. Know? Better put it on the right kid. I know, right. I know. Yeah. That's probably where it will go. And uh, uh, I've actually got the demo of Let's Dance as well, which is, 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 is interesting in as much that it's so totally different from the way that Niall arranged it for the album. And made it into this thing. <laughs> this, made this thing, it. yeah. Uh, what, almost a monster for your own bad? Um, yeah, one can't be too sort of uh, negative about it because, in, in terms of exposing me to a, a whole new range of people, I mean, it was um, um, superlative. But I mean, uh, obviously, it does carry its own sort of baggage around with it, doesn't it? That's hard to be, um, especially when you sort of, you know, kind of strive to to be seen to be interested in, in varying the forms of music and playing around with them and, and working with the mechanics of how music is put together and producing a new kind of collage or a new statement of music. You know? And I just thought, fuck me, I'm a pop star now. And now this is going to be really, what do we do with this? And it was a real question, those two albums, of what do we do with this? And certainly that time you kind of think, I know what, I don't want to do with this. You know? I, I don't think I like this at all. With, I, mean, I mean, both those albums made, uh, as I say, both of those albums tonight and never let me down. Still sold better than anything I've done before Let's Dance. Yeah. So that was an irony. But, but, you know. but we don't talk about but tin it's We don't talk about tin machine sales very much. Uh, we did a million. Well, not bad. Not bad. Sold better than never let me down. Yeah. Which is extraordinary. Yeah. That's extraordinary. Um, again, uh, it's I'm in a very odd position here because the guys who are working in the band. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly did deserve a financial break. I mean, none of them. I mean, none of them session men. None of them have sort of being had one of these cozy kind of session men kind of livings. I, mean, well, I remember Hunt Tony from Iggy's. They're Hunt and Tony, you know. Yeah. I mean, they haven't changed. They what? They're what they are, man. You know, they are. They are kind of you know a fairly street uh, street edge guys. I mean, and, and they deserve a break financially. So it, it, it one hopes that. They can gather some kind of, you know, financial momentum from the Tim Machine. But then, how did they feel? On the that? other hand, <laughs> I don't want that to have to interfere with what we're trying to do as a band. But how do you, how did they feel about your going, you're doing this tour, you know? When they know, they know that I want to do this badly. They know, and they're prepared to. I think the only thing they're probably a little worried about is that we won't get on the road fast enough with Tim Machine. Mm -hmm. Um, but on the other hand, it does give them time to play around with the tracks that we've done in Sydney, which is yeah, which is 25 of that. One presumes like 14 will actually be on the album. So there's uh, uh, post-recording work that they definitely want to do, and, and I hope should be doing on it right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I know they will because Reeves makes sure that all that gets done. He's very together. Um, I think they uh, understand what I'm trying to do. I mean, I guess. They might feel a little bit out of the picture on this one, but as I say, they do have their, their own project that they yeah. are working on. So there's a degree of fulfilment, and their time is not wasted during the time that I'm on the road. A cynic might say you're doing this tour... But there again, I never promised them the world. Yeah. You know, it's like... Yeah. Well, one might say that, that you're doing this tour to finance Tin Machine. You could look at it that way. <laughs> I look at it like this. <laughs> <laughs> you won't be drawn on this. <laughs> no. no. It would help. It will help. <laughs> you also hinted that you're going to be using video in a yes. dramatic way. Can yeah. you elucidate on that at all? 
Um, only in as much that it, it seemed to me that there, there was a lot of, uh, there was a kind of an archaic feeling about those two little guys on the edge that you get in gigs these days. That it's very modern to have video up there, but it's now been there ever since we've known about video and stage. Mm -hmm. There must be a way of integrating it with the stage more. Okay. And that's what we're attempting to do. And at the moment, we've got some effects with it, which I find, I think, are absolutely stuffed. Does this mean, Extraordinary. Could, could this mean then that it looks on stage as if there's sort of you at th about four foot high from however it is, and then also a video of you at about eight foot high? Possibly even more than that. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, a great is a, town. Is there a big enough, will, will, will the division be big enough to satisfy I hope so. My <laughs> ego. <laughs> Mustn't anticipate questions. Um, no, that's unfair. Uh, Well, I think uh, I think it will be big enough to satisfy my ego, yes. <laughs> but hopefully, I also hope it will be big enough for the audience to see what's going on. I mean, just talking to you now about the way that you seem determined right now to put aside childish things, if you like it. I mean, th there's, it seems that you, you've reached a certain point in your life. I mean, Joey is now basically an adult. Yeah, uh, hold on, hold on. Uh, childish things. It was uh, the uh, uh, African right, uh, African right. Uh, Time to decide childish. Yes, things. who is it? It's uh, oh, Roger Kipling. Yeah, Carol. yeah. Uh, it's uh, Jungle Book or something. Or something yeah, like that's that. right. Yeah. But I mean, you know, your son, your son is now really an adult. Yes. You are at some point perhaps going to marry Melissa. It, yes. Which, and which will which will mainly mean starting another family. Mm -hmm. So are you kind of restructuring your? Putting aside your past to start a, to start again. From I think actually I, I I am painting myself into a corner. Yeah, but I don't think that that's new to me. I think that's something that I periodically have done all my life. Is is do that very thing. Uh, going to Berlin was was had exactly the same kind of thrust to it, which was to change my motivations, re uh, re-establish links with what I wanted to do when I first started writing and performing. Um, and reactivating an interest and excitement and enthusiasm in myself for both my work and for life, generally. You know, I think one, I think one does do that. Yeah. I mean, I, it, but Berlin was a strange. I mean, I spent six months in Berlin yeah. when I was seventeen, and it was a very odd. I mean, when you went to this is a strange place because it's very strange. You have East Berlin was very different then. Yeah. You were also presumably you're getting off drugs as well. Yeah, absolutely. So one had you, you and Jim. Yeah, absolutely. Had a very heavy weight around. That. And we weren't going into programs and all that. It was a quite kind of, you know, how are you doing, Jim? How are you doing, Dave? All right, man. <laughs> I mean, it was like, they were haggard days in the beginning there. You know, it took, they took, it took that good three years to sort of, you know, kick that atmosphere of, of actually needing something to rely on. Yeah. Oh, horrible. So, but, but, I mean, now, I mean, you, I mean, there's been... Obviously, I've got to ask you about, about, about Joey. He seems yeah. he strikes me as an extremely sensible young man. <laughs> I mean, everything I've ever read about him seems Yeah, he's, he's a good boy. I mean, I mean he's a... Again, I think I, that obviously has to be the uh, other secondary factor why my life had to change in the yeah. you know, quite honest. Um, and he was with me during that period. And, uh, Must have been quite strange for you. It was very, it was very uh, odd for all of us. I mean, it was me coming off one thing getting back into understanding the responsibilities that one has to undertake in a camp. Um, uh, establishing a new communication with him, which I haven't had a good communication with him for quite a few years, but since, since about his second year, because then it was the road and it was this fame thing and rock, and he was always with his nanny. Yeah, you know, didn't know his mum, but... No, exactly. And he, didn't, and, and he didn't know me, so it was all that, you know, going through all that. Now we're in a situation where I hate to use a cliche, but there's a, a, a there's the uh, the brotherhood thing. You know, yeah. one feels because he is an adult now. I obviously, you know, understand and see the youthful attributes that he has, and he obviously sees the old man in me. Yeah. You know, but somewhere in there, that I think I'm still that there's still a vibrancy between us. We're both interested. We're not disinterested people. So I think that you know we've established a. A uh, very firm relationship, and we love each other very much. Yeah. But I mean, you said at the press conference that he has no sort of real interest in music. What's what's he interested in? Well, okay, his two passions are rugby and uh, uh, American football. I know. Don't. Is he a Wolfman? My son, the jock. He absolutely. Oh yeah, he played for Gordonston, and yeah. uh, 
he, uh, he now um, plays for, uh, uh, I think he's just gone to the trials for uh, the team where he's at the moment. And, uh, uh, and he also plays American football three, four times a week. <laughs> he's a big guy. I mean, he has... Um, How big is he? Because you're, I mean, you're not a bit, you're not particularly tall, are you? No, I'm five ten. I mean, he's about 5'11". Um, but he's about wide, you know, very wide, yeah. But, well, so he can beat you up if you misbehave? You know? I, I, would, I, I would hope he would never get to that. <laughs> I don't believe in parent abuse. <laughs> but what, he's left Gordonston now? Yeah. Is he yeah. going to go on to university? Or? He doesn't know. I mean, he's going to you know, go through with the uh, A-level thing. And I, I think he probably would like to take a year and make up, make up his mind exactly what it is he wants to do. Which is fine by me, because I remember what I was like at 18. And the difference was is that I, there was never any doubt in and I think it's difficult for a child, I can't call him a child, for a teenager, uh, when there is no specific thing that they're divinely drawn toward, to actually understand that it doesn't, that whatever decisions they make now, it's not, they're not irrevocable. Yeah. He can change his mind. Yeah. It, he doesn't have to say, oh God, what am I going to do for the next 40 years? You know, yeah. it doesn't, it's not that. It's, about it's also less ease, easing oneself into a situation that you find firstly fulfilling and secondly provides you with an income. But it's less easy now than it's it was when you were 18. Absolutely. And absolutely. when I was 18, I, mean, yeah. I, could, I knew I could always get a job or change now. Yeah, no, it's not like that. No, it's not a given. And especially if you're not going to go, which you uh, understandably, I guess in some ways, does not particularly want to go into uh, an entertainment sphere. Um, I think in... Because in, uh, it would be only too easy to pull strings on that. Yeah. It's like... So I think uh, I think he's thinking about you know, taking. Well, I, and I've, I see that with all his peers; they're all very much of the same kind of thing. But too serious, man. He's a serious lad. But he's not that. He's not. He's What's he's done here? He's um, he's studying ancient civilization, English lit, and political science. Liberal arts education. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do, you, do you think he'll go? Where, do you think he'll? Presumably, he speaks a couple of languages as well. Yeah, he does. What French? But, yeah, French. <laughs> better than you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody speaks French better than you. Oh, I noted that at the press conference. Yeah. I, I can, I, yeah, I'd rather get an accurate translation than, than find myself uh, Say the wrong covered word. in faux pas. Yeah. It's probably the sun masquerading yeah. as a Frenchman yeah. anyway. I can creep around, uh, yeah, exactly, that's what I really need. I can creep around uh, the shops and, and uh, get my cigarettes, and uh, I can s- establish communication yeah. with people, but um, uh, as for following a conversation, I have but you see, the trouble is, it, the, 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 the leftovers of the colonial age are, are still with us. It's so easy to speak English everywhere yeah. that unless you are drawn to languages, which I'm not, then you know, so, uh, a part of it, uh, do you speak English? <laughs> so, well, like, yes, of course I speak English, especially you know, in Switzerland and that language. Paris is hard because they speak English behind your back. But yeah, they won't speak English. <laughs> I'm so angry. South of France, totally yeah. different. They're wonderful. But um, I think in Switzerland it's, it's relatively easy to just speak English everywhere. Well, when I was in China for two months, I mean, English was a second language. I learned a bit of Mandarin, but yeah. it was just, you know. Bravo, I mean, that's, that's really well, awesome to, it's to pick up. There. Very difficult. Yeah, it's a fine tone thing, isn't it? Um, four in Mandarin. Is it four? Four, uh, four, nine. Nine. four in Mandarin, nine in Cantonese. No, seven in Cantonese, but people reckon there may be nine, and they're keeping the other two quiet from the, from the foreigners. Did you ever hear of a guy called David Kidd um, that worked in, uh, he worked for New Yorker magazine? late 50s and early 60s in uh, uh, Peking, Beijing, um, and established himself as some kind of uh, aristocrat and married the daughter of the uh, high court judge in Peking and lived the life of an aristocrat right up until the revolution. And it's a, it's a wonderful book that he wrote. I met him, he, was, he lives over in Japan now. He lives here, uh, expat American, went there. Oh, I see, I know the book you mean. Yeah, um, the read. Emperor's Horses. Yeah, the Empress Horses. Extraordinary story. Absolutely delightful story. He ended up going to uh, escaping and going to Japan, teaching Japanese philosophy to the Japanese. <laughs> Unbelievable. And uh, his wife went on to America, which I think is a wonderful changeover. Yeah. To, uh, to become a, uh, become an IBM troubleshooter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's so weird. It's yeah. a weird place there. Because I gather you're very interested too in sort of um, South, the whole sort of South. So, uh, that, yeah, the rain there, and uh, in particular Indonesia, I find fascinating. Why Indonesia? I think probably because one feels that it's the last undiscovered area, in a way. There's not that much that's on, on, on 
record, apart from a couple of movies like The Year of Living Dangerously and you know, Sueto's um, Government, Peter Weir's film. Um, but the, the idea of the feeling of the lost continent, kind of thing, the Lombok and Flores, and stretching over to Iri and Java and all the other way to Sumatra. I mean, it's, it's, wow, it's just like. I have a friend that to all of spent six months in. Um, do, you, do you know the Blair Brothers? Lawrence, I don't know them. No, but do you know the work? Yes. The Ring of Fire. Yes, I mean. But Lawrence is a, a good friend of mine, and uh, he really sort of. Uh, Help me bone up on, on what it is that is exciting about that part of the world. But it, it's un, it, it is different, isn't it? It's that area in New Guinea, what used to be New Guinea, where they're where all the tribes speak different languages. And, yeah, 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 within meters of each other. I mean, like to, that village to village, a man is killed if he should dare talk with a girl in the next village. I mean, like, uh, I find that fascinating because I mean, like, I want to, you know, I'd love to go into some sort of deepest jungle because you've got to do something there's, there's I'm sorry sure for that, that moment so, I mean you know for me Joseph Conrad is the be all and end all of, you know it's the idea of James Brook out there sort of having the Dayaks come to him and saying yeah. please can we go and have a few heads today you know saying no you can't have any heads today I've got a bat on it you know it's like it's also loony you know, but I mean do you want to do that so, I mean do you want no, to, I don't want to do that <laughs> no I don't but, um, I mean, do you want um, to sort of travel in that yes yeah world, I do I've done Java I've done Java um, I've been to Java several times, a much better way of saying it. Uh, I find that an extraordinarily fascinating place. And I've been to a, a part, actually, I still find, because of its Hindu basis and animist kind of feeling, I still find that Bali, northern Bali, not southern Bali, which I think is virtually destroyed. Which Australian took, sort of It's, it's with horrendous in as much that it's the usual syndrome, where it's just like a continental kilns and uh, it, it, it's all gone, it's over, it's finished. But once you escape the artist's village of Ubud and get north of there, um, areas like Karangasan and uh, Singarasha, all along the top coast there, it is an extraordinary experience because virtually their way of life has, uh, has not changed for four, 400 years, 500 years. Uh, they are the only island within that whole belt that it, uh, never uh, uh, was never taken over by Islam. So there's, there's the, the only island. Ah, that's interesting. Yes, so you've got the rest of it is solid Islam, except Bali. It's Hindu animals. So there's a jet of feeling, a um, far more esoteric, mystical feeling there. It's, 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 uh, there's a great equilibrium. Uh, the thing that fascinates me is the balance between dark and light, good and evil, right and wrong, that they keep this balance. That they, but that's always been apparent in your work anyway. I, I, yeah, I think there's probably a psychological reasoning about it, that this feeling that one is not just ruled by one set of passions. Both come to play all the time. Um, and, the, and it is manifest in that island. I mean, it's an extraordinary experience. To, to be able to go into some of their villages uh, late night and see some of these celebrations and things that happen, it's quite unnerving. The trances with the, the self-dagger things, you know, it's like guys pushing these hideous Chris. Uh, oh, but is that the one where they turn the handle and leave the blade inside? No, they don't actually punch their skins. Most of the time. Yeah, but sometimes it, they screw yeah, up a bit. But that, I mean, it's, it's the shirtless and the, and the blade is, is positively producing a, 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 a yeah. cleft within the flesh and, the, and they're out of their minds. And it's like, it's sort of, where am I? You know, yeah. what is going on? This is so unnerving. And I like that unsettling feeling. I've always liked that. That's, it's, always, it's always been a great inspiration for me to be somewhere that I don't understand. And when I do understand it, it feels flat and sort of, you know, everything goes tepid and I have to move. The problem with Indonesia is actually the politics of the place. It's They're very debatable. I mean, it's, you know, rainforest destruction. And <sighs> and to an unbelievable extent. I mean, the amount of, of uh, cutters that have been sent into Irujawa is just phenomenal. I mean, something approaching a million cutters have been sent in there. Yeah, I mean, that forest has a few months. I mean, it's uh -huh. a, a million cutters at uh, those forests. It won't take them any time at all to completely demolish it. Um, yes, well, the other side that, that will be interesting in the not so distant future, of course, is when Hong Kong collapses. Yeah, when that changes over, there's a very strong feeling in that part of the world that it's Indonesia that's going to pick up on that business, not Singapore or Taiwan or all the other. Or Bangkok. Bangkok. Not at all. There's a great feeling towards But I think, uh, but they'll have to get their act together a little bit better. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, because, I mean, no one's going, to, no one these days is going to pump a lot of money into a place that is um, so, government is blatantly destroying what little time we have left on yes. this land. Yeah, absolutely.
absolutely. But I, I'm pretty sure that we'll see a, 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 an extraordinary face change in Jakarta hmm. over the next few years. They're pumping a lot of money into it now, isn't it? Yeah, I, hope be interesting. I haven't been there myself. I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated now in going into um, northern Burma, Laos, and... Oh, God, um, Burma. I've always wanted to do that. It's an eight-day trip, isn't it? Just yeah. one, one way. Then you get out the other side, and you can get your visa renewed and go back the other way, so you can actually spend 16... Well, it's very hard at the moment. They would, I mean, I was yeah. trying to go there last year. I was yeah. going to go and try and do some, you know... I would say more interesting stories, but non-music stories. And, I mean... Friends of mine have spent time in Laos, and when we were in China, we spent a lot of time in Yunnan, which is not yeah. really China at all. It's much nicer than China. Yeah. And I mean, that whole area, again, it's lots of different people, different languages, different customs. It's fabulous, isn't it? To spend a night in Rangoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I, it hasn't changed. One of the first objects I ever bought when I was a kid was a Burmese sideboard that I found at a junk store. I bought it for £17. And it was the official Burmese entry to the uh, great exhibition at the Crystal Palace. It was phenomenal. Do you still I, have it? I still have it. I still have it. Where it is it? It's a real white elephant. I mean, it literally. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Nobody wanted this huge, great, dusty, wonderfully hand carved piece of furniture. And it was in a junk shop in Beckenham. And I said, Oh, that's magical. Where does it come from? And he said, Oh, that's called Burma. Oh, where's that? You know, it was like, and uh, that always sort of got me. You know, it was like, where does it live now? It lives, uh, it lives in Mystique. <laughs> it lives in Mystique. Where? Well, so it went this very well yeah. because the, it was built for that kind of conditioning. You know? So it doesn't have to crack or whatever. Because everything you take to the islands cracks immediately. Yeah. So um, it's an impossible place to take things like that. But that was from the right parts of the world. Where do you live now, then? I'm based in Switzerland. I have been now for ten years. Yeah. Close on 10 years. Well, near, like, near the skiing? Yes. <laughs> Within an hour and a half. Which um, resort? What? Which resort? Well, which is... Uh, I've never skied there. I was in Flint. Uh, you won't be mine to the way it's going. Kind of I was in Flint at Christmas. Were you? Yeah, it was pretty... It's, they say it's pasture land at the moment. Yeah. You, can, uh, you can take a copter over and it's all... It's just green. It's hiding mm -hmm. land out there. And shopkeepers are going spare. Because yeah. this, is their, this, is the, this season is it for them. So they don't make any money this season, that's it, because it's just a little tiny quiet village the rest of the year. So they're absolutely fine, because it's three years in a row, mm -hmm. and they're going out of business and you know, setting up. Unbelievable. This weather change is incredible. However, yeah, so I'm based there, and it really does, that is the operative word, because yep. I spent so little time, uh, the six months, for instance, is, uh, for this last six months, this last month I've been in America, off and on, I spent a week and a half, ten days on holiday. Um, for the Christmas and New Year bit. That was Musty? Yeah. Well, you, well, you've got a place there as well. Yeah. Didn't you? And uh, uh, then, uh, just before then, I'd just come on from Australia where I'd been in Sydney with the band. And we'd spent two and a half months there working. Um, then I went to, so from Musty, I went to New York and I established myself there to do pre production and uh, rehearsals for the tour. And before Sydney, I'd uh, been in uh, Java and Bali. And had done my first real trek around Australia, which yeah. was just fantastic. Well, that sort of right in the outback, and yeah, the yeah, that, the real, you know, the real thing. And I mean, do you travel alone, or do you go with me? At that particular time, I was with uh, Melissa, yeah, and uh, Koga and her boyfriend, and we sort of, the four of us went up there, and we went over to uh, Kakadu Park and, and just uh, got lost there, and it was just uh, the most extraordinary piece of land I've ever seen in my life. It was just phenomenal. So. Historic and ancient, the stone structures that. Hello? <laughs> yes. I think you've stopped everything. Yeah. <laughs> can, can you just come in? Yeah, sure. Not right. um, I hope so. I've only had about a 20 minute. Um, I mean, it was also. So, so yeah. that's how my life tends to go. Yeah. If I'm not working, my passion is travelling. So if I'm not working, if I'm not travelling because I'm working, then I'm travelling because I like travelling. And I want to be Eric Newby. Right. <laughs> I want to be all of those guys, Paul Thoreau. Go, go, go to you now. You'd really like it there sometime. That's really interesting because it's just different and it's not really touristy. But that one, yes, that does sound interesting. My other passion would, would have been, has been, now Tibet, which I've never got anywhere near. But I'm, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's now. difficult. There's a real, real problem. China is coming part of the seams like Russia is. I, mean, I know. I, people think that Peking was bad. What happened? There, but I mean, if, they, if it was really if Thatcher had ever allowed anybody to really sort of present the facts about what happened in Tibet, 
Yeah, a complete genocide, without doubt. Well, that's unfortunately Chinese habit. Yeah, they don't like people who aren't Chinese. Um, you mentioned because it was in Australia, really, that you got together with Melissa, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Uh, well, it had come together very slowly. I mean, we'd been sort of seeing each other off and on throughout the tour. I mean, it was. Uh, I mean, originally, I, I wanted I wanted somebody who I needed for two pieces in the show. Yeah. I needed somebody who did ballet. So I needed a ballet dancer, but I didn't want luggage, so I wanted somebody who could also do other kinds of dancing. And trying to find a ballet dancer who could do street dance was almost impossible. And there were only two girls, it was Melissa and another very attractive blonde girl that came up to the auditions, that uh, had their roots firmly established in ballet firstly, but knew enough about street to be able to, um, uh, were doing uh, jazz dance as well, uh, were able to pick up what I needed in that area. And Melissa, because of her black Irish, Spanish kind of look, uh, I thought that's great. She's was it? She's great. wholesome, peach, yeah, and all that. With, with um, I mean, because your Australian tour, there was all that you had all that problem with the rape case as well, didn't you? That would that all fit in at that time. No, that, uh, that yes, it would have been around that period. Yeah. yeah. I mean, did that sort of, in a sense, because I gather from that tour, you weren't able to sort of perhaps enjoy yourself publicly as much as you. Did that sort of no, help your relationship in, in a sense? In no, that didn't, that, that didn't happen until I carried on what you might say, enjoying myself. <laughs> um, no, because we'd been actually coming together over that entire tour, and as the tour petered to an end, and it was like, well, are we going to see each other again? Were we going to make a commitment to see each other again? Yeah. And uh, we said, yes, we are. We actually enjoy each other. Why is she, why, why does she, why is she done that, you know, lasted, if you like? She fulfills something in me, I suppose, that, that, uh, that I don't have within myself. And I think one always looks for that in a relationship. There's a bright, very solid, uh, uh, totally buoyant uh, uh, attitude towards life that um, is, uh, is something that, uh, that, that I, I find irrepressible. I'm oh, it's the television. <laughs> Oh, that's horrible. You can't turn it off. Say that again. <laughs> yes, you can. That's the one thing you can always do. Um, and uh, I found that I, d I just found, found that increasing, increasingly uh, um, exciting to find somebody so buoyant about life, their life, and, and, uh, and how wonderful life was. But it's quite an age gap, isn't it? Ah, <sighs> twenty years. Yeah. Where's the yeah. Nothing. I don't. No, I don't. I don't think so. I don't find it. I, I've seen. I've seen couples. I'm sure we all have that are far closer in age to each other, have absolutely nothing in common whatsoever, and probably shouldn't be with each other. I don't think the age factor is it. It's question of whether you relate to each other yeah. in any kind of <laughs> meaningful way. I mean, ignoring the marriage question, which has been gone because I think it just <laughs> the press here just want you to be respectable again. Um, uh, Do you think that's what it is? I think it is. I think they want you to be old. They want you to be old and married. You know, that's, they always yeah. want Mick and Jerry to be married because it sort of means you know they finally joined. Joined. So, joined. They finally joined. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but do you? I mean, do you want more children? Um, oh yes. Yes, I, I quite like. I quite like that more children. Um, I very much want to make sure that there was uh, the correct. That my life was in, in, in the right kind of receptive situation to have more children. You know, I learned so much with Joe, having Joe grow up with me, that I realised that I would have to approach that situation with complete yeah. sensibilities and not be quite so willing to just be away all the time. Yeah. Is Melissa the right one? Then? We shall see, won't we? <laughs> <laughs> But, I mean, you've, you've said in the past that you actually just sort of, you, you, you suddenly fell and realised that you'd fallen in love with her. Is that yeah. actually, where was that? That was after two or so. <laughs> where were you at the time? In Australia, having a holiday. And it really, as I say, it was a question of, well, after this, we go our separate ways, or do we? And I think not. I don't think we will have separate ways. I'm enjoying this. Let's, let's keep it enjoying it. So it's a very easy decision to make. Except, of course, that she's busy the whole time. The she's busy the whole time, but it does mean that I spend an awful lot of bloody time in Los Angeles, which is not my favourite city in the world. 
but um, you know, one has to do that. What's the movie? It has worked out really well in as much that we're very rarely working at the same time, which has been great. Steve Martin has a new movie kind of coming out called uh, My Blue Head, mm-hmm. and um, she was asked to do that, the, the dance sequence as well. So as a dancer, as a dancer. And uh, in between that, she uh, works with the company, but of course that is not uh, a rent paying situation. Yeah. Um, you do a uh, ballet is for love, you know, and so she does the the film things or uh, what's called indus- in- industrials, I mean, and uh, uh, any video things that come up to um, play around. But one does collect a lot of so-called acquaintances on route as well. You just know they're not going to be best friends with you for life. <laughs> well, they're there for the uh, they're there for the party. There's an awful lot. Oh, awful. Th- they used to be an awful lot. I think that. Assisted. I've made positive moves to make sure that a situation doesn't occur too often because it's very hard to have people grasping at you that much of the time and taking so much and giving so little back. Okay, and last, disappearing. last question. When when you're alone or you know when when you're not when you're when you're being completely by yourself, I mean what yeah. do you what, what do you do in a day? I mean how do you spend it? A working day or a non working day? A non working day. A non working day. I think, uh, inevitably, I wake up and read. Yeah. I read a good solid two hours before I do anything. I read, I read at breakfast. Not, not, not a particularly sociable man at breakfast. I, do, I just read. I like to read. Then, I, um, then I'm, when I've eaten I my, a fill of whatever chapter I'm on, uh, then I, I... I like to talk, really. I like to discuss things. And firstly, I like to see what's in the paper. And for me, that's the Christian scientist or the... At the moment, the uh, trip, uh, trip, which is okay, but the uh, scientist, Christian Scientist Monitor is probably the be- one of the better papers, and you know that. <laughs> it's one of the better papers that's actually presented fairly accurately, poss- possibly as accurate as possible a picture that you, you can get of what's happening. Um, and uh, if I'm at home, then I'll paint or um, uh, I'll write a little. Again, if I'm not the mountains, I'll ski all bloody day. But <laughs> yes, I know. That's better than anything, really. Uh, um, it tends to be quite quiet. My, I guess, looking at that, it's, quite, it's uh, fairly reflective. When I'm not working, it's kind of reflective of days. Yes. They're reading, thinking, talking days. What are you reading now? Uh, right at this moment, when I, I kind of gave you a clue earlier, I'm reading Traveller's Tales by Eric Newton. I'm also reading Anthony Blunt's theory of, uh, uh, theory of art in uh, Renaissance Italy, 16th century. Which goes in with you know, your love of painting, like yeah. Tintoretto. And yeah. And music? Uh, music I'm listening to. At the moment, I've been passionate about a thing by Steve Wright called Different Trains, which was his interpretation of his problems as uh, Jewish American coping with the feeling of the Holocaust and what it did with his relations. It's a superb piece of music, absolutely great, with narration. It's rather like a sort of a, a classical rap. He takes the uh, voices and quotations of survivors of the Holocaust and puts them against, and samples them and puts them against the uh, music. It's a journey through that whole period. It's quite incredible. It's really wonderful. And pop? Uh, I won't say the pictures again. Well, then we got the idea right. I'll tell you what I like. I think Dylan's new album is great. No Mercy. And that's a wonderful new album. And the best thing he's done in an awful long time. Uh, I listened to Public Enemy. I'm not quite sure why I make it. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Let me see. And the victim. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I'm playing Tim Machine tracks night and day. So I'm so madly excited by the next album. 